molten rock rising from deep within the earth, erupting on the surface and hardening in layers down the sides. This forms the familiar dome or cone-shaped mountains. Most people's idea of a volcano is a lovely symmetrical cone, and this involves magma coming up, reaching the surface, being extruded either as lava or as uh, explosive eruptions as, as, as ash. And these layers of ash and lava gradually accumulate until you're left with a, a classic cone shape. Volcanologists know this smooth-flowing magma contains huge quantities of volcanic gases, like carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. Because this magma is so liquid, these gases bubble to the surface, easily escaping. There are thousands of these normal volcanoes throughout the world. Around 50 erupt every year. But supervolcanoes are very different in almost every way. First, they look different. Rather than being volcanic mountains, supervolcanoes form depressions in the ground. Despite never having seen a supervolcano erupt, by studying the surrounding rock, scientists have pieced together how supervolcanoes are formed. Like normal volcanoes, they begin when a column of magma rises from deep within the Earth. Under certain conditions, rather than breaking through the surface, the magma pools and melts the Earth's crust, turning the rock itself into more thick magma. Scientists don't know why, but in the case of supervolcanoes, a vast reservoir of molten rock eventually forms. The magma here is so thick and viscous that it traps the volcanic gases, building up colossal pressures over thousands of years. When the magma chamber eventually does erupt, its blast is hundreds of times more powerful than normal draining the underground reservoir. This causes the roof of this chamber to collapse, forming an enormous crater. All supervolcano eruptions form these subsided craters. They are called calderas. The main factor governing the size of eruptions is really the amount of available magma. If you've accumulated an enormous volume of magma in the crust, then you have at least the potential for a very, very large eruption. The exact geological conditions needed to create a vast magma chamber exist in very few places, so there are only a handful of supervolcanoes in the world. The last one to erupt was Toba, 74,000 years ago. No modern human has ever witnessed an eruption. We're not even sure where all the supervolcanoes are. Yellowstone National Park, North America. Ever since people began to explore Yellowstone, the area was known to be hydrothermal. It was assumed these hot springs and geysers were perfectly harmless. But all that was to change. I first came to Yellowstone in the mid-1960s to be a part of a major restudy of the geology of Yellowstone National Park. But at that point, I had no idea of what we were to find. When geologist Bob Christensen first began examining Yellowstone rocks, he noticed many were made of compacted ash. But he could see no extinct volcano or caldera crater. There was no giveaway depression. We realized that Yellowstone had been an ancient volcanic system. We suspected that it had been a caldera volcano, but we didn't know where the caldera was or specifically how large it was. As he searched throughout the park looking for the volcanic caldera, Christensen began to wonder if he was mistaken. Then he had a stroke of luck. NASA decided to survey Yellowstone from the air. The space agency had designed infrared photography equipment for the moonshot and wanted to test it over the Earth.
NASA's test flight took the most revealing photographs of Yellowstone ever seen. What was so exciting about looking at the remote sensing imagery was the sense that showed it in one, one sweeping view of what it truly was. Christensen hadn't been able to see the ancient caldera from the ground because it was so huge. It encompassed almost the entire park. An enormous feature. 70 kilometers across, 30 kilometers wide. This had been a colossal supervolcano, certainly one of the largest known anywhere on Earth. Bob Christensen was determined to find out when Yellowstone had last erupted. He began examining the sheets of hardened ash, dozens of meters thick, blasted from the ground during the eruption. What he found was three separate layers. This meant there had been three different eruptions. When Christensen and his team dated the Yellowstone ash, he found something unexpected. The oldest caldera was formed by a vast eruption two million years ago. The second eruption was 1.2 million years old. And when he dated the third and most recent eruption, he found it occurred just 600,000 years ago. The eruptions were regularly spaced. Quite amazingly, we realized that there was a cycle of caldera-forming eruptions, these huge volcanic eruptions, about every 600,000 years. Yellowstone was on a 600,000-year cycle, and the last eruption was just 600,000 years ago. Yet there was no evidence of volcanic activity now. The volcano seemed extinct. That reassuring thought was about to change. There was another geologist who was fascinated by Yellowstone's volcanic history. Like Bob Christensen, Professor Bob Smith has been studying the park for much of his career. In 1973, he was doing field work, camping at one end of Yellowstone Lake. I was working at the south end of this lake at a place called Pale Island. And I was standing on the island one day, and I noticed a couple of unusual things. The, uh, the boat dock that we normally would use at this place seemed to be underwater. That evening, as I was looking over the expanse of the south end of the lake, I could see trees that were being inundated by water. I took a look at these trees, and they were be being inundated with water a few inches, maybe a foot deep. And uh, it was very unusual for me to see that, because nowhere else in the lake would the lake level have really changed. What does it mean? We did not know. Smith commissioned a survey to try to find out what was happening at Yellowstone. The park had last been surveyed in the 1920s when the elevation, the height above sea level, was measured at various points across Yellowstone. The idea was to survey their elevations and to compare the elevations in the mid-70s to what they were in 1923. 